I'm very excited about this next panel um, and the paper that they have written for us. Um, before I introduce them, and I think that many of you know them already, um, I want to take this opportunity to let you know that your Children's Youth and Family Division uh, met Tuesday and Wednesday uh, in D.C. And, uh, and I want to give a couple of thanks and give you a couple of corollaries of how the conversations yesterday and today have been so similar to the conversations that they had last Tuesday and Wednesday. I want to thank, even though I haven't introduced her yet, Michelle Zabel at the TA Network. And I want to thank uh, Gary Blau, the Children's Director at SAMHSA, because every other year, they basically write into all of this heavy paperwork to have one of their meetings be a Children's Youth and Family Nashford meeting. So where we don't have to worry about paying for a room or AV, and they also helped 11 of your members get there and put them up in hotels. So very thankful for them. 42 states, District of Columbia and Puerto Rico was our attendance at the Children's Youth and Family Division. It was incredible. It was an incredible two days. It was jam-packed. Over the course of the last eight months, we've been working on what their priorities are, and the top five were the five things that we concentrated on. Four of them are things that you guys have been working on the last today and yesterday. School violence, opioids, youth suicide, and what you're going to hear about today, crisis services, uh, but even more than that, a lot of discussions on how a lot of you are drowning in RTCs on the children's side, and many of you have had to ramp up uh, sending kids out of your state for treatment uh, and at a heavy cost and how we get a handle on that. Um, but it was a good, very good two days, and I also want to give a shout out to Diana's uh, children's director, Sandra Parks, who's the chair, who did a fabulous job uh, pulling the meeting together. So this paper, Making the Case for a Comprehensive Children's Crisis Continuum of Care, you're going to hear a lot of similarities, so things that you've heard from at least two other presentations. But this is going to be really focused from the kids and youth angle, which has a few differences. But mobile crisis response, you heard from David Covington, uh, a lot of things that you heard around suicide, uh, a lot of the conversations you guys have had about drowning in inpatient uh, facilities, that all ties into the work that they did. Um, so let me introduce you to the participants today. Um, Michelle Zabel is the Assistant Dean uh, at the University of Maryland School of Social Work, and she's also the director of the TA Network uh, that just held the training institutes. And let me tell you, Megan, um, I know you've done a great job, and, and it, this is kind of stressful, but they just hosted 2,000 participants over five and a half days uh, with 280 sessions. No. 60? 160. Oh, 160. Yeah. I heard, okay, I'm from Texas, and so we always, so 160 <laughs> sessions. And, 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 not, and not to jinx anything for this, but, but, but they also had to deal with, in the middle of everything, the fire alarm for the hotel and all the meeting space going off, and an evacuation of everybody. So, um, that may, may help you feel better. Um, <laughs> But Michelle, other than being, you know, uh, a, a, an amazing resource for Nashville, has over 25 years of experience working in child and family serving systems, both in the public and private sectors, uh, both at the organizational county and state levels. Um, she is really uh, uh, an expert around um, training and technical assistance around wraparound, systems of care, service systems design, financing, uh, and she also dabbles in juvenile justice and child welfare issues. Um, it, the, so I, have, I had you guys mixed. Uh, Diana Simons uh, is also an amazing person at the TA Network. And more than her work in children's, youth, and family uh, issues, she's also the national president of the David Robinson and Tim Duncan Fan Association. 
Uh, we both are, we, we, we bond that we're both big San Antonio Spurs fans. So if you're a basketball person, don't get in conversations with Diana because she knows what she's talking about. Uh, but Diana has over 20 ex, uh, years of experience in policy and service design, development and implementation, contract and project management, Medicaid and public sector managed care, and the provision of technical assistance and training. Uh, she currently serves as the lead on clinical best practices, wraparound and workforce development for the TA network. Uh, and we're really happy that she's here. Uh, and then probably the person in the room uh, that, ha that has a fan club in Val Melke, uh, and Lynn Kovich, who are former, new, current New Jersey commissioner, former New Jersey commissioner. Liz uh, was just on our Children's Youth and Family Division until Michelle Stolder, uh, and was really a leader for many, many years. Um, Liz uh, uh, was the uh, former assistant commissioner for New Jersey's S Children's Systems of Care. Uh, she joined the institute, or, I think, earlier this year, didn't you, Liz? January? December. Um, as a clinical instructor, she's a lead consultant on several grantees, part of policy and systems design, financing hub. Uh, even though we really, really, really miss her, um, she's uh, in this capacity. She also has direct oversight of the ch statewide children's behavioral health, substance use, and developmental intellectual disability systems. So I welcome the panel, and I will hand it over to Michelle to set us up. We are really excited to be standing upright after our conference and here with you. So thank you for inviting us. Um, I'm really just going to frame this up a little bit and then hand it over to my colleagues. Um, this conversation, for as it is probably for all of you, wait, I'm doing this wrong already, um, is really important to us. And I just wanted to give you a little context so you're aware of some of the activities that um, the TA network is undertaking. And I guess what I should say is, in case you don't know, the Technical Assistance Network for Children's Behavioral Health is actually funded by SAMHSA. So we are the funded entity to provide technical assistance to children's behavioral health across all the states, tribes, and territories. So we work with your people very regularly. Sometimes we're working deeply in your communities and your counties and with your providers. We definitely work with your children's behavioral health directors and their teams. So it's a privilege to be here with you. Um, for me, I actually had the privilege of starting um, at that midpoint in New Jersey when New Jersey was designing its system. And so my exposure to designing and developing a crisis continuum comes out of um, a lot of New Jersey's efforts to understand what other states were doing, design something that could go statewide. And so as a reminder, you know, and I know you all know this, but when a child goes into crisis, it isn't just the child. It's the whole family. A lot of times, sometimes it's the school system as well. It's the extended network. It does look and feel differently. For any of you that are parents, you know deeply and abidingly your kid's homework can send you into crisis after you've had a long day work, right? Imagine a behavioral health crisis on top of that. So the design of a system like this has to have customization that looks different than adults. And so in New Jersey, Liz will talk about this in much more detail, but the um, effort became began to look around the country and see who's doing this well. And so all things in children's services a lot of times go back to Milwaukee. They had a MUT system, it's the mobile unit treatment team, and so we at that point went, visited, and that was really the birth of it. Today, when the kids directors get together, Diana will talk about a peer-to-peer -peer meeting that we've been hosting with many of your states. The, the, the core components of this model look very similar. The financing is going to look different. Diana will talk about that. The way in which states roll it out look differently. But the core components, you can really see those states who are implementing those core components have a shift in data that is impactful and supportive and families feel the impact of it. And so we are really on a... Um, we are on a tear right now to have this conversation in the country because there is so much that this kind of model can benefit 
uh, in terms of all the issues that you've raised as a priority. I will say from the system of care side, and I was raised a system of care girl, I came into this field as a CASP girl. Um, you know, we ran quickly to wraparound implementation. And that is a lot of times what states really put in first and foremost when they're implementing a system of care. And as much as I love wraparound and love good solid care coordination for people, a mobile response and stabilization and crisis continuum is a game changer in states for kids and families. And I personally feel like that has got to be a, a hallmark of what we do over the next few years in our states, that we take advantage of the lessons learned, we install these models, and we help stabilize not just our behavioral health systems, but as Liz will talk about, our foster care systems and other services, service systems that depend on on us for stability actually are impacted as well. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to my colleagues who are going to like get into the weeds of it, but I know what else I was supposed to say. But I will tell you the National Governors Association and some other national associations have reached out as well. So we are really grateful to NASHBIT that we were commissioned to write this paper. And from the beginning, we talked to them about the fact that after we get this to you guys and we hear back about the receptivity of it, we We'd like to flip this kind of same information so that NGA has it for when they're orienting, orienting new governors, that we give it to Medicaid directors, that we really hit all the national associations, particularly so they can install it in their orientation approaches. Because we would like to be as helpful as we can to get some kind of common understanding about what kids and families need and benefit from when you customize a crisis system. So that just be aware of that, and we will absolutely communicate with Nashville so that when we get it to NGA, you guys are knowing that. So if anything trickles down from your governor's office, as you know from whence it came. So thank you for having us, and I'm going to hand it over to Diana. Thank you, everybody. Um, I am uh, not uh, steeped in wraparound. I come from Massachusetts, and my background is in Medicaid managed care. Um, I'm a child trained clinician and was around when um, Rosie D was being sorted out and settled, and uh, have worked um, in and around financing and policy for a long time. So, um, Mobile Response and Stabilization Services are one of the uh, core uh, CBHI services that were implemented in Massachusetts back in 2008. So we've got a 10 year run. And I'm very pleased to hear that they're going commercial insurance very soon. So yay, Massachusetts. Um, so uh, I, uh, as David had mentioned, I lead the TA Network's um, hub for uh, best clinical best practices, wraparound and workforce development. And one of the uh, things that we're doing within that hub is a peer-to-peer uh, um, -peer convening on mobile response and stabilization services. We've been doing it now for two years, since April of 2016. 23 states, uh, communities, and territories have been through our twice yearly convening. Uh, this is by application. Teams uh, are often a multi-stakeholder, multi-child agency, decision makers that come together for this two-day convening that's very overwhelming that has included Liz as our faculty, which she still is, but she can't be faculty from New Jersey anymore, so she's, <laughs> she's TA Network faculty. Um, but we work with teams on uh, trying to figure out mobile response and stabilization services in their respective states. And, um, our next meeting, and I'm pitching this to all of you in here, our next meeting is uh, December 11th and 12th. Um, we have been very lucky to have had New Jersey offer to host us for the last two years, but now Connecticut is vying for it. Um, so we may be actually in Connecticut. Michelle said, you know, back in the day uh, when we were looking at, when New Jersey was looking at mobile response and stabilization, and certainly when Massachusetts was, um, you had a, a handful. There were one or two best practices. So in your case, it was the mobile urgent treatment team in Milwaukee County. For us, it was Mutt and New Jersey. And uh, when we started our peer curriculum uh, three uh, almost three years ago now. Um, it was um, Mutt from Milwaukee County, it was New Jersey, and it was also the EMPS system out of Connecticut. There were, those were the best practice sites that have seen, had seen some data and were doing sort of statewide uh, or countywide initiatives. So they became our faculty for uh, this 
two-day convening, the next one being in December. Uh, today, as I'm standing before you, I'm really pleased to say that we've added to our faculty the state of Nevada um, and Polakowski. Um, Nevada is a state that has implemented mobile response and stabilization outside of a system of care. They've done it statewide. And also uh, Oklahoma, Shamika Williams will be part of our faculty for that meeting, and they've done a tremendous job. And these are not um, urban states uh, with a lot of capacity, with a lot of workforce. These are uh, rural frontier states. So we're very pleased that it's um, it's being designed in places that really have a lack of services and supports, and they're, they're managing to do it. So I'll get on script now. Uh, so Michelle had mentioned that um, a uh, green. green. <laughs> Green, thank you. Green, I'm like, wait, green, red, I can't, I can't, I don't know what to do. So that um, <laughs> a comprehensive crisis continuum um, has certain components. And all of the, uh, the, the next generation models of, of mobile response and stabilization and all of the, the ones we look to as best practice have um, as core components screening and assessment, ideally using a validated screening tool. Often states are choosing things like the CANS or the CASI because they all already have those or because it's an easy lift to try and get those in. Um, mobile crisis response, which mobilizes to where the child, adolescent, um, or youth, young adult, family is experiencing the crisis. Crisis stabilization services and residential crisis when necessary. Psychiatric consultation in real time and referrals and warm handoffs to home and community-based services and ongoing care coordination. Um, so. Mobile response and stabilization services, as Michelle said, they effectively de-escalate, stabilize, and improve treatment outcomes. And they're specifically de to, uh, designed to intercede upstream um, before an urgent situation becomes an emergency situation. Um, and they're instrumental in diverting from unnecessary emergency department use and out-of-home placements and placement disruptions. The research base on the effectiveness of mobile response uh, for children and, and their caregivers is growing. In 2013, SAMHSA and the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services um, jointly recognized mobile crisis response and stabilization as not only cost effective but clinically effective as well. And as states and communities shift their children's behavioral health delivery systems toward the more upstream public health approach, there's interest in models that can prevent unnecessary uses of acute settings. I have to do both of these. Would you like to do it? Nope, that's fine. So uh, crisis means different things to different families, and it's important to use the family's own definition based on their own needs and strengths. A significant percentage of persons seen by mobile response and stabilization service providers have not previously received behavioral health treatment. A first experience in receiving crisis services can be daunting, and if families' priorities are not respected, they may choose not to seek services in the future. So engaging families in a culturally and linguistically competent crisis response is not uh, essential just for reducing the risk of the current crisis or preventing the future crisis, but also for developing trust with the families. So we told Diana that we would interrupt her, and I just feel like that is one of the, I just want to kind of raise that up for people in the room, this idea that the family is defining the crisis it is important for people to kind of think through when you're digesting this information. So um, Liz is going to have examples, but uh, you know, realistically families can call and say, my kid went off to school a mess. I've heard from the school my kid is still a mess and they're coming home. Please come now, right, before it goes really out of control. So the threshold for crisis for kids in this model looks very different than an adult acute crisis model. You're not trying to screen out, you're, you're responding to a self-defined crisis because we're not just trying to de-escalate a situation, we're trying to find people so we can help them, right? And this is, if a family has decided it's bad enough at home that I'm going to reach out as a mom, come on, think about, like, if you decided I'm going to call for a crisis team that I don't know to come into my home, somebody needs to respond, right? It's not a matter of, like, is, is it homicidal, suicidal? It's none of that. Yeah. We're coming. We're coming to help. Yeah. 
Um, so I just have some emergency department data that's part of our, our the paper that we did. Um, when a child or youth or young adult experiences a behavioral health crisis, um, families and caregivers frequently turn to law enforcement, hospital EDs, and inpatient treatment for help. But um, the numbers that you see here, um, these increases have occurred even as the number of psychiatric beds in the nation's hospitals have declined from 34 to 22 beds per 100,000, roughly. Um, and, uh, and that was between 1998 and 2013. So the historical response to crisis has been uh, emergency departments. And um, it's tricky because EDs often lack the specialized expertise to effectively respond to a pediatric psychiatric emergency, leading children to being boarded in EDs for hours, which I'm sure you're all aware of, or even days until an appropriate placement becomes available. Um, care in emergency departments is expensive for payers and time consuming for parents and children who will have to wait to access care a second time after being discharged from the ED. In addition, the reductions in lengths of inpatient days have led to increases um, in ED visits and rehospitalization among children, youth, and young adults, further raising concerns over the effectiveness of inpatient treatment and the availability of quality community-based alternatives. So essentially, emergency departments are set up for physical care before behavioral health care. And secondary to that, they're set up primarily for adults. And so when a child of 10 or 9 or 3 or 15 enter an emergency room, it's often very difficult to find anybody who has that specialization. Okay, so this is the better outcomes. This was a slide you wanted to, to talk about, I think, Michelle. Well, I mean, I think, we, I don't want to take over. The, <laughs> That's right. you go for it. Yeah, you yeah, you no, do. <laughs> no. I mean, the, the, I guess the point that we really want to make to you is that the, um, the actual use of inpatient care for kids should be the absolute last resort. And we're not, and we're very much preaching to the choir in terms of, uh, you know, running the behavioral health system of today. But to have something that goes into the community and will stick with them, one of the um, things that I'm not sure we mentioned is that the, the way that we define mobile response in the community is that the crisis, you know, the crisis arc will last 30, 30 I forget. 72. 30, 70, the initial 72 hours, 72. thank you. Um, and so the crisis team is there for that long, but the, the ongoing stabilization, we see states use it between uh, four to sometimes eight weeks. And that's another component that looks very different in what we're talking about versus a traditional crisis system. So you've got the capacity to be in a family's home for up to 72 hours at the level that they want and need you there. And then you've got the ability to work with them and stay with them for that longer period of weeks so that you're ensuring that they're getting the kind of care coordination and stabilization support so they can get into the behavioral health system. So that gets an, that's an added element for kids because so often the crisis happens and they still aren't capable of getting to a psychiatrist or they're still not capable of getting into the treatment services. I'm not really sure that looks very different in the adult system either. So you can consider that for how you think about your adult system, but for what we're promoting for the kids system, that stabilization component is really a game changer because it's the piece that helps families transition successfully and not reuse the crisis stabilization. You're not getting these recidivisms in terms of calls because you're sticking with them until they're in the appropriate level of care. It's that idea of meeting them when they define the crisis, sticking with them until you can get them to the right part of your service array and system. So. Right. Okay. So um, inpatient psychiatric treatment, we know, is an important component of a children's behavioral health system, particularly when a child is experiencing suicidality or psychosis. But as the field of behavioral health continues its trend toward uh, treatment in the least restrictive environment possible, it's critical for states to develop high-quality, comprehensive crisis continuums, just as Michelle said, available to their children, regardless of payer within their public behavioral health system, which are crucial to achieving the two goals that you see on this slide, diverting from unnecessary ED use, and then um, providing more meaningful alternatives to inpatient care. 
Um, there's some federal guidance that we, uh, most of you are probably familiar with, but I will, uh, I will say it again because it bears repeating. In 2013, the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, uh, and CHIP Services actually, at CMCS and SAMHSA, released a joint informational bulletin, um, and they named several services that were critical to developing a high quality crisis continuum, including mobile crisis response and stabilization and residential crisis stabilization. Um, the other a more recent uh, bit of federal guidance is the Interdepartmental Serious Mental Illness Coordinating Committee Charter, or ISMIC. Their first report to Congress in 2017 uh, identified defining and implementing a national standard for crisis care. So those are two pretty um, important pieces of federal legislation we just wanted to draw your attention to. Um, and then, uh, this is just a review of what we've already said. The value of mobile response and stabilization services within your crisis continuum. Um, because of its ability to intercede earlier, because of its uh, ability to divert from ED use, um, and keeping children and youth and young adults at home whenever possible, and in school and in their community, um, provides less disruption and keeps, um, uh, it's a viable alternative to acute care. So there are some examples of cost savings uh, that we put on these slides so that you could actually have them. I'm not going to go through them except to say they reflect Connecticut and King County, Washington, and Pima County, Arizona, and Texas. And what I will say about these uh, places are that they're vastly different from one another. They're financed differently, they look different, they have different populations, um, but they've been able to do it and realize cost savings. So this is not a cookie cutter approach. It's very individualized to um, the populations that you would serve, um, your states, your communities, or, um, you know, rural frontier urban environments, and it can work in different places. So these again are the crisis continuum components. Ideally, if you have a comprehensive children's crisis continuum of care, you would have a single point of access, one phone number to call across the state, no wrong door, it doesn't matter what child serving agency you, a child would uh, be connected with, they would be able to access this service. Um, there would be a crisis hotline 24-7 access, an electronic health record, which would be ideal, is not required, but it sure does help, and it helps if people are also able to access one another's health records, and it's a similar platform, but we all know that doesn't happen much, um, especially with child serving agencies. Um, the ability to triage, which is that first 72 hours, um, that screening component, and then the mobile response and stabilization assessment, so it's a comprehensive assessment, and the ability to intervene for the first 72 hours and then be able to stay in there for up to eight weeks. Um, there's um, residential crisis stabilization, which is a component that's always useful to have in a crisis continuum because there will always be children that need to be out of the home, but not necessarily on an inpatient unit. Um, and then recovery and integration strategies are also um, components that are Im important to consider in building this. The MRSS elements we already went through, and I'm not going to take any time to do that, but they're there again. Um, system coordination, so, you know, effective coordination of child serving system partners in addressing the needs of children, youth, and young adults and their families is essential, and it's an essential function of a comprehensive children's crisis continuum. When a child experiences a behavioral health crisis, the family is apt to engage with multiple child serving agencies, pediatricians, mental health clinicians, schools, judges, child welfare, you name it, um, and coordination of the system partners is required in order to maximize access to necessary care and to minimize the risk of re-traumatization and duplication of services and costs. So engaging communi community partners early in the process of developing mobile response and stabilization services is critical in identifying which services are likely to meet the community's needs. In addition to direct services, mobile response teams provide education to local police departments around trauma and crisis response to specific children and may assist in developing protocols to meet community-specific challenges. They've done that in Milwaukee. They're doing that in other states. Are they, they're doing that in New Jersey as well, right, Liz? Yeah. Um, so um, MRSS teams also um, train child serving system partners in um, things such as mental health first aid, in trauma, crisis intervention, and suicide prevention activities. So they really go beyond just working with the families and the youth to being a community resource as well. Okay. So 
So partnerships between pediatric primary care and behavioral health are an important component in the continuum of care. In a children's crisis continuum, an MRSS team's ability to connect a family with the child and adolescent psychiatrist or a nurse practitioner who can consult with a child's primary care provider around diagnosing, treating, and managing behavioral health concerns is extremely valuable, particularly um, in health professional shortage areas like, for instance, Nevada and Oklahoma and many other states across the country. So psychiatric consultation can assist in the primary care provider in determining whether referral to specialized care is necessary and provides timely introduction and continuation of psychotropic medication if needed. This is something mobile response can do on the fly and it doesn't take seven or 14 days or however many days to actually get a renewal of a prescription that might avoid a, a full-fledged uh, crisis for the family. Children engaged in child welfare um, have a higher risk of experiencing complex trauma and demonstrating negative behaviors associated with that trauma. So engagement with the child welfare system itself can cause, and it can engagement with that child welfare system can exacerbate whatever trauma um, is present anywhere. So, so a trauma-informed uh, crisis intervention must be available to children in foster care and to foster parents. Liz, do you want to talk a little bit about the, the use of uh, trauma-informed care with child welfare in New Jersey? Sure. I was going to, but we can add here. Sure. So um, a few things about the child welfare system. Um, what we knew from um, our experience in New Jersey was that uh, our youth were moving about six times before they touch on the behavioral health system. They touch on six different uh, foster resource homes, as they're called in New Jersey. And we wanted to change that. We wanted to change that dynamic. So what we uh, did was put a work group together um, and piloted in one county um, the use of mobile response and stabilization uh, for every youth who went into a foster resource home. And with that, they were bringing some tools with them, including how to build a trauma-informed um, home, but that's a little more complicated. But this was not complicated. We send mobile response. The worker goes with the caseworker when the youth is um, placed in a uh, foster home. And they have a simple conversation, really simple. And it's for four-year-olds right up to 18-year-olds. And that simple conversation, by the way, age-appropriate. Uh, for our four-year-olds, so they need different tools for the four-year-olds. But they basically say this, something big just happened to you, because something big just happened to you, you may have a hard time eating, sleeping, school might feel different. You, happens to some children, it doesn't happen to everybody, but if it happens to you, we know what to do about it, and we'll be back here in an hour to help you. Say so the same thing with foster parents. Something big just happened, this child might have a hard time eating, sleeping, paying attention, school might feel a little different. And it happens to some children, doesn't happen at all, but if it happens to this child, we know what to do and we'll be back here in an hour and we'll help you. And what happened is 46 out of 46 youth in the pilot stayed in the first bed that they went into with zero moves for behavioral health, zero. They all only had planned moves, some returned to their families. By the way, mobile response can return with that family, because this trauma didn't just happen to this child, it certainly happened to the family as well. And so uh, from that, it became statewide and is now in policy in New Jersey that every child who goes into a out-of-home, uh, foster home, uh, because of concerns around abuse and neglect, mobile response has to be there within an hour of their going there. So, and the, the, the early results are just really powerful, really, really powerful. Thanks. Um, so the other uh, coordination uh, component is with law enforcement. So youth may unknowingly identify, I mean law enforcement may unknowingly identify youth um, or young adults who are in need of support. Um, however, when they lack appropriate resources or training, um, identified children and young adults especially are at risk of being placed in unnecessarily restrictive settings beyond what is necessary for maintaining their safety uh, or the safety of the community. So ongoing training, communication, and support for law enforcement personnel is a is essential to a well-coordinated crisis continuum and certainly something that a mobile response team can do. 
They train and support local law enforcement, and the partnerships results in better coordination, identification, and connection to appropriate supports and services. Uh, schools are natu their natural partners in the work of a children's crisis continuum. Schools see children on a daily basis and may be able to identify early behavior change. However, school personnel may not know how to connect a child and family to appropriate services and supports. Um, they, schools have historically used the ED and law enforcement as crisis intervention for children demonstrating concerning behaviors, but when schools collaborate with partners in the crisis continuum, um, alternatives to the ED can be used to address concerning behavior in lower intensity settings using home and community-based interventions. We've certainly seen that in Massachusetts. We understand and appreciate that there are places in this country that have 300 plus school districts and they all operate independently and that the Department of Education at the state level cannot address um, all of those needs or concerns and they function in a different system. But coming from a state in which there was a, <laughs> a, a federal lawsuit that uh, used both the SAMHSA and the IDEA definition um, of severe emotional disturbance. I will tell you that in those areas where the schools have been partners, the results have been very good um, and that they do want a partner. They do. They actually want the, the help as well and have welcomed it in, in many places. Um, and I, I mentioned the uh, emergency departments earlier that although EDs are part of a children's crisis continuum of care themselves, the emergency room is a viable option. Um, they're designed primarily to address physical, not behavioral health needs and adult needs, not uh, the needs of children. Um, so uh, connecting the ED to a mobile response team can actually be a useful thing as well. In Massachusetts, um, the emergency department can actually call the mobile crisis team to do the behavioral health assessment in the emergency department. Um, that's kind of tough for some people to hear. They're like, wait, what? Um, but it can happen. It's monitored very closely. Um, it, you know, the mobile response provider is monitored so that not, you know, it's a very small percentage of their, um, their um, evaluations that actually happen in the emergency department, but if a family or youth or young adult refuses to be seen in the home or the emergency department itself calls and says we need somebody to come out, they do. They mobilize wherever the, the emergency is. Um, engaging with juvenile justice and family courts as partners in the crisis continuum assists children and youth and young adults with behavioral health needs in connecting to appropriate services and supports. The potentially traumatic impact of juvenile justice and the court system on children may be ameliorated if the connection to appropriate services and supports is the court's primary driver. Do you want to talk a little bit about the vicinages in New Jersey? Sure. So uh, in New Jersey, there are um, 15 court vicinages, and the system of care is actually uh, arranged around those 15. And so that means um, in each of those 15 communities, there is uh, care management, which is the wraparound. There's mobile response and stabilization and peer support. Mobile response and stabilization and peer support are really two important components for, in, for the court vicinages because they're services that are immediately available to the juvenile justice system. And really for youth who, are in, um, who have touched on the juvenile justice system or in family court, those services and supports are able to actually initially get started immediately. So judges really like them because there's immediate access to care. There's no delay in access to care. Has how uh, the, those um, two services um, have been so important. New Jersey has seen a, a dramatic um, decline in the use of um, detention centers. Nine detention centers in New Jersey have closed. And New Jersey closed its first prison. So we've been around long enough to do that. All right. Thanks. Um, so uh, parent and youth organizations, community organizations, family-run organization, youth peer organization, faith-based organizations, other community groups should not be overlooked as partners in a comprehensive continuum of care um, for crisis for children. The ability to connect to high-quality, sustainable community supports is key to preventing crisis and escalating behaviors, and they should be at the table early and often. Um, so... I think you keep going. I think I'm going to skip this one um, and just say that the information's in your PowerPoint. <laughs> so I want to talk a little bit about um, financing. Um, it, this is a, a very, very broad brush note, but um, 
The capacity to provide mobile response across subpopulations of children, youth, and young adults without regard to payment source is pretty critical to ensuring consistency of practice and keeping children, youth, and young adults in their homes. So creating payer-specific eligibility criteria can unnecessarily direct some children to more restrictive settings that are more expensive and less effective than home and community-based services. And this practice also creates confusion for child serving systems on when and how to access care. So the ability to access the crisis continuum when the situation is still manageable at home reduces the burden on already overburdened, as we said, other systems. Um, but the funding streams are usually an and, not an either or. So Medicaid, commercial insurance, local and state educational funds, child welfare foundation grants, federal grants, um, mental health general funds, you name it. Uh, corporations in, in uh, rural areas, we were just talking at the last mobile response and stabilization meeting with uh, Cirilla Blackman from Indiana. And she was saying that there's an area um, that's quite rural, but that there's a large um, manufacturing company or corporation, or there's just a very large uh, employer in the area. And we were talking about uh, the potential of tapping that employer. Most very large employers, like Target and Walmart and all of those big ones, have uh, foundation arms. They have charitable arms. They love to contribute to good causes. And if they're in the community that's being served, that's one source of sort of funding for mobile response and stabilization funds, because those are the children that they're serving potentially in those communities. Strategies for financing include braided funding and blended funding and reprioritizing where funds are used. Um, I'm not going to dive into those, but whichever method is used, um, it's, uh, it's reinvesting the savings that are garnered by avoiding more restrictive and expensive care setting into the crisis continuum promotes the sustainability of partner child serving agencies charged with providing home and community based services and supports. So if you're saving money with mobile response, put the man money back into mobile response. Um, and those are just the ways to do it. And now we're on New Jersey. Before, as we transition to Liz, I wanted to give everybody um, a head, heads up that three years ago, the Children's Youth and Family Division uh, worked collaboratively to do a white paper that's on our website around the youth bulletin uh, that Diana re referenced. Uh, that has a lot of strategies and examples of how uh, to, to, to make those changes in your Medicaid plan uh, to cover a lot of these critical services, and, and crisis services are part of that. So um, that, that's available on our website. Thank you. Okay, so now I, I, I'm going to talk about New Jersey. Um, I'm going to talk about New Jersey because uh, New Jersey's been around for a long time, and I've been reminded to tell folks that New Jersey's system of care has been around for a long time, and so um, it's uh, gone through quite a few um, changes, upgrades, innovations, all kinds of other interesting things. But what's important about that is if you lay the, really the, the groundwork, then innovation can happen, and it's important that that innovation happens at some point along the way. And that the components that we talked about already of being really important uh, parts of a crisis continuum for children really can be helpful for you in the long term. So let me tell you what that means. Uh, New Jersey's Children's System of Care sits in the Department of Children and Families. It is a, a partner to uh, child welfare, the child welfare system. They sit side by side, but there's a firewall between those two divisions. And by, by that I mean that only children who haven't experienced abuse and neglect touch on the children's system of care. And the children's system of care is the de facto behavioral health system for the child welfare system and the juvenile justice system in New Jersey. What's important is it is also a public health model, so it can be used for any child, any parent, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, can pick up the phone, call a single point of access, which by the way, this is an incredibly busy slide, right? I know that. Um, the, the cool part about this slide is that for parents, all they need to know is one thing, that that slide, that, that box that says Contracted Systems Administrator, ASO, 1877, that's the only thing they need to know. They can call that number 24 hours a day, seven days a week, and all of these other things can happen because they called that 1877 number 24 hours a day, seven days a week. So let's say you are a parent of a 15-year-old who won't get off the sofa. It doesn't sound like a crisis, right? But it's a crisis to that parent whose child the day before or the last week before was pretty engaged. We know they're not ill. We know they don't have the flu. Something's really going on, and we don't know what it is. That's a pretty anxiety-provoking moment for a parent, right? School calls, says your straight-A student is now flunking, right? What do we do? And that's really what 
mobile response and stabilization is sort of designed to do, is to go out to say, okay, we should take a look, see what's going on, right? Help this parent who's experiencing this really moment when their child has shifted and changed and we don't know why, and try to connect the dots on what's going on for them. What's really important is when any parent, as Michelle has said, picks up the phone, makes that bold step to call the public mental health system and ask for help, that the public mental health system says, what can we do to help you? We're going to send somebody, we're going to help you, we're going to hand home, and we're going to help you keep your child in home. I'm just going to give you a quick example of what that looks like. So I received a call uh, when I was uh, actually in the field from a parent um, of a six-year-old who said, my child's ready to get kicked out of school. She's six, right? She's the bully in the school. Her parent knew that. She was pinching other kids, getting into trouble, had zero kids at her birthday party. Pretty sad, right? This is not something you want to send a six-year-old to an emergency room for, but it is concerning because the school is now talking about suspending this child because the child took a magic marker and painted the bathroom completely black Pretty interesting, right? I thought pretty creative. Um, but long story short, we connect school, mobile response, parent, all together sitting at a table. We fast forward a full year. A full year later, this child is now fully engaged, lots of people at a birthday party, straight A student, incredibly engaged in school. And more importantly, this school actually understands now that mobile response is gonna be helpful. By the way, we fast forward now eight years because it's been eight years since she touched on that system and she's doing incredibly well. So let's just merit, just think about this for a second. This six year old gets kicked out of school right, misses school, is left behind by a grade because now she's been suspended because people don't know what to do. That is the power of mobile response and stabilization. The impact of the dollars and what we've saved by not sending the six-year-old to the emergency room, which was part of the advice that she was receiving, that um, worry of the parent, by the way, who was employed and doing great work in the mental health field in one of the most rural parts of New Jersey, really important. So there's really uh, a, an important parts of the work that's just really powerful and important to talk about. So let me also talk about this. Um, New Jersey is a densely populated state, but it has major rural components to it. And we have 15 uh, mobile response and stabilization units and 21 counties to cover, which for some folks is a pretty good distance. So how do you think about that? How do you think about where you're gonna put your workforce and where they're gonna sit so that they can be available 24 hours a day, seven days a week with one, one hour any place in the state? That requires partnerships, it requires major partnerships, major thought about where they're gonna sit, major thought about traffic, because some of our most rural parts of the state, in fact, I'll probably tell you a lot about this, <laughs> one of the most rural parts of the state is also surrounded by traffic to get out of the most rural, beautiful part of the state is really complicated and difficult. So you have to think about the communities that you serve and how you're gonna actually get there. And there's a lot of really interesting coal work to do that when you put people around the table to solve those problems. And we were able to solve those problems in New Jersey by just really coming together and thinking about that. I also want to talk about just real quickly um, how powerful mobile response is um, in working with youth with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So in 2012, Governor Chris Christie made the decision he was going to move, lift up and move services and supports for uh, children, youth, and young adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities and substance use into the children's system of care. When that decision was made, and I was not even at the state quite yet, my first day I found out we had three months to do this sort of major move of 16,000 families with intellectual and developmental disabilities. And I also found out on that day, which I didn't know before I took the job, because no one was brave enough to tell me, that um, there would be no tools. So uh, as an example of the single point of access, their contract was not ready, and we would have four months that we would have to manage all of this without any support from the ISO. We negotiated some things that were helpful, but. So my staff was gonna to need to do that. What we did have, we had mobile response. Mobile response was available 24 hours a day, 70 days a week for any child in the children's system of care. And what we did was we trained those mobile response workers, uh, infused training in every part of their life, right, to help them uh, be able to be ready to work with children who were nonverbal. And what they did is they elevated their skills, showed up, 
and work with families who were frustrated and overwhelmed, who had children who were aggressive, and they didn't know what to do. Most of the parents who were calling for assistance were asking for respite care, and I couldn't give them respite. They didn't really even need respite, but it was the only thing they knew to ask for. But what they did know is that their child was struggling, and what we did find out is that all of them, all of the, the children that mobile response uh, responded to needed that response. What we also know is that in that response, our mobile response teams told us what we needed to do to build a fully um, a viable service array, the services and supports that were going to be able to help our children who were most vulnerable, our children who were nonverbal, who didn't know how to communicate. Really, really powerful. And so let me tell you, fast forward, right? So 2013, we have the two number populations of children in the emergency room are six to 10 year olds with autism and 18 to 21 year olds with autism. We fast forward two years where we built 15 crisis stabilization beds for the six to 10 year olds and a full service array of, of supports for those uh, six to 10 year olds. And we didn't need not one of those crisis stabilization beds. And one of my partners in the inpatient world called me, you guys will appreciate this by the way, <laughs> called me and said, Liz, during the summer when it's most robust with children with autism, and said, Liz, listen, I have a pretty uh, big problem. I have, uh, I have all your beds are empty. You're inpatient. I have not one child in an inpatient unit, and I need some of those beds for the adults. Could you, could you help me out? <laughs> could you help me out? This was not the problem two years ago, because we used mobile response and stabilization as a guide for us moving us forward. All right, so I'm going to tell one more thing, and then we'll take some questions. Let's talk about um, individuals with substance use challenges. All right. So this is a real difficult uh, challenge for, I know for a lot of you, certainly for the state of New Jersey. And Mobile is one of the leaders in getting out there and talking with uh, youth. One of the biggest challenges, and I talk to a lot of children's uh, behavioral health directors, the biggest challenge is how do you actually identify and engage individuals who are using substances at that 14, 15, 16 year old, right? Because they may be using marijuana, they may be using um, uh, alcohol, getting them into treatment is really complicated um, and overwhelming. Training your mobile response teams to actually recognize substance use, recognizing when and how to engage and engage in community activities and community supports on top of the, um, the idea of getting a good screening and understanding what substances you're using is all part of the crisis continuum that can really uh, begin to attack the issue and challenge of the opiate epidemics that most of us are challenged with. So I just wanted to say that. Uh, two two uh, facts that I think are helpful. Number one, New Jersey has uh, the lowest number of children in foster care on any type of psychotropic medication in the country. Um, that data is, I think, pub uh, published on the Center for Healthcare Strategies. Uh, you could certainly get that for you. Um, that is because of the attentiveness around uh, providing services and supports to those children in, in foster care. And number two, um, they have a declining population of children who in residential. The residential numbers are plummeting in New Jersey at the moment. So the, at any given day, they're serving about 37,000 children. And today, they have 1,052 who are in some type of out-of-home treatment setting. Uh, not, doesn't include foster care. includes everything but foster care. And with that, that means children with intellectual development, disability, substance use, all of those. So it's just really important to know that all of the impact of the mobile crisis services in, spa, in, in New Jersey has been really impactful in all of the higher intensity of service. I'm going to ask you a question. Yes. Because we're going to move to questions. But Liz, um, sometimes I witness that states struggle with the idea of a single point of access. Yes. That, uh, they have a more decentralized approach. Mm -hmm. Why would you advocate for it or what would you do to accommodate? And sure. then could you also just throw in 
the idea of a warm handoff. Yeah, absolutely. Two yeah. really, really great points. So the first is a single point of access. I would absolutely use a single point of access for a few reasons. Number one, you want a single triage. You want uh, the same questions being asked across the state. You want to compare apples to apples. You want the right intensity of service at the right time for the right duration. Connecting kids to the right care at the right time is the, the is really the role of the single point of access in New Jersey. So certainly, there are a lot of different ways to get to that. You can use, um, uh, I know I'm working with a state that's doing some geo-mapping, using one place to call in, and then the calls are directed, but they're using the same triage and same assessment tools, and that's a way of getting to some of that work. Um, there's a lot of different ways of problem solving, but the goal is you want the same script when a parent calls, so they don't get different messaging. You want the same triage, the same questions that are asked, and the same uh, assessment across the board. Yeah. And I would also say mm -hmm. that when we say parent, we also usually mean um, case manager or child welfare worker or juvenile justice yep. worker, that they're just as confused on how to access the behavioral health system as parents are, and a lot of That's times true. they're the ones needing to make those calls. So the, the closest people can get to having a number that they can call no matter if they change right. jobs and jurisdictions, but you're just training your whole community that this is the number, um, is really helpful. It was Absolutely. just as helpful for judges and yes. everybody else. Everyone else. Yeah. There's the lack of confusion about who to call. So as an example, you can train every pediatrician on who, who to call. Right, you can train every. In fact, the um, the uh, police in New Jersey uh, are trained by mobile response, and they carry the one eight seven seven number with them and a card, uh, so that they can help to connect families. And they and they do that all the time. So, a quick example: you have a you know you have a fourteen year old who stole a bike. You don't want that parent. You don't want that police officer who catches them to put that child in a detention center, right? We would like to do something else instead. That. A uh, police officer can work with a parent on calling for mobile response and stabilization. Let's see if something else is going on, right? Um, there's a lot of different uh, ways of being able to connect uh, the dots, but that's one of them. The other part is the warm handoff, which I think is incredibly important. Um, and warm handoff basically means when um, when the parent calls uh, the 1877 number and asks for help, the that performed care actually connects um, the mobile response unit, so the parent perform care and mobile response all on the phone, all asking, you know, perform care guides part of the questions and then mobile response will ask a couple specific questions. And as an example, they'll ask the question of why did you call today? Like what drove this, you know? Why did you pick up the phone today, right? Um, instead of saying what's the crisis? <laughs> right? what, what made you call today? Some parents will say it's the only time I have, right? But this has been going on for four months, but this is the only time I have. Well, then we know it's really urgent and we need to get there, right? Not complicated. Mobile response team itself will ask specific questions about making sure we know your location. They'll want to know if there's a dog in the house. Why would they know, want to know that? They want to know if there's a dog in the house because, you know, Dogs are really friendly, but they're also very protective of owners who are now escalated and you have, you have a visitor in the home. So there's a conversation about how to make the environment safe for the workers as they come in. So that's part of it. But that's all can be taken care of as part of the warm handoff. You can also do warm handoffs for any other call place. In, as an example, in New Jersey, uses 211. And there's uh, NJ Reach, or Reach NJ, I always get that backwards. Um, and those uh, folks actually are trained on how to you had to uh, connect with the single point of access and the warm handoff component of making sure there's a true connection before they hang up so that we make sure that every family who reaches out actually gets assistance. Those are some of the power. So do other people have questions? We have two mics here. Oh, okay. I feel like you know what to do. Go. I'm going to sit down so I can share. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yep. Thank you so much for your presentation. I'm Barbara Bazron, the Deputy Secretary for uh, the State of uh, Maryland. And I have two questions. Mm -hmm. One of them is that the uh, the youth who are, are getting stuck in our ER are those who are on the Asperger's uh, mm -hmm. uh, spectrum. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and often those parents are so frustrated that rather than and calling, they go to the ER, mm -hmm. and then sometimes those young people are just abandoned there, yes, and uh, then become wards of the state, and.
and in other instances they go there and because of their presentation they wind up being either boarded in the ER mm -hmm. or stuck in uh, in the hospital for long periods of time because of the lack of services and supports that are, are outside of that. And so I'm wondering from a crisis perspective uh, how you ameliorate that particular uh, circumstance. So that's one issue. The second one is around the use of family peer partners. Mm -hmm. I heard you talk about a lot sure. of things, but I, I didn't really hear you talking about as a part of the connection to the community and the ongoing support structure, how family peer partners are being utilized over time to provide additional support to the family. Both great questions. So I'm going to take the first one. Okay. The first one is, and I'm going to take the first one because that's exactly what life looked like in New Jersey in 2012 and 13, and to be honest with you, well into 14. But we started to see a substantial change in that. First of all, we had to help parents of children with autism and with all intellectual and developmental disabilities, we actually had to train them how to use the system. And in the beginning, they actually didn't want to call they didn't want mobile response to come because they, it was the Department of Children and Families and they didn't want to invite child protection into their world. And we had to explain to them, when we send mobile response, we're not sending child protection, right? Child protection is not going to come unless there's abuse and neglect. And the only way to get that message out was to actually uh, get to all the advocacy folks, right? So we got to every advocacy group and parent that we could get to to say mobile is a, a service and we want you to use it and then we want you to tell other parents to use it. And once that happened, once the parents understood that mobile was there to help them and was going to hold their hand and help connect the dots, because mobile de-escalates the crisis and connects the dots back to the community supports and services. And if there's a higher intensity of service that's necessary in order to meet the needs of a child, then that can happen. But it starts with mobile really holding the hand of that parent. And that's where we went from all of these children in the emergency room to zero children in the emergency room. And I'm not saying that it doesn't still happen, right? But there's a process in place. There's a way for, for engagement to happen for those um, screening centers for the emergency rooms to connect to the system yeah, of care in order question. for that to happen. Yeah, that my question was, yep. uh, is there feedback from the ER yes. that knowing and saying, can you yes. provide the support? That's yeah. exactly right. So what we also train all of the screening centers, so all the emergency rooms we train that if you have a child, not just a child with autism, but a child in your emergency room, you can call the single point of access and find out information. If there's somebody already engaged with that child, then you can call them direct and they're responsible, they're going to step up. And if there's no one involved, which is most of the time, uh, they, they haven't been connected to the system yet, then we'll send mobile right to the emergency room or we'll send mobile response to the family's home so that you can, you can discharge that child back home now, and we'll make sure services get there. But mobile would go right to the emergency room to ensure that there's a good, clear connection. So there's a lot of ways to think about this work, um, in particular for youth with autism. Thank you. So Liz, before yep. Barbara asks her second question, how long do you think New Jersey took to get that message out? Was it a full year? No. Was it a year? How long? So let me give like, you, what was the press so yeah, that they get a sense of? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Let me just give you a, an example of how that happened, right? So I walked into a room just like this, full of parents who were angry at me, yeah. right? Every single one of them was upset with me because yeah, things weren't working the way that we wanted to. And we worked through all of the challenges each of the families had. I promised them I would be back in a year. And when I came back in a year, that they would, could give me feedback about how we were doing. They could certainly give it to me in between, but I would be back face to face with them in the room. They didn't believe I'd come back because they spent all that time yelling at me. And I went back in a year, there were three parents in the room. Not one of them had been there the year before. I asked the folks who sponsored us, um, to, I asked them, I said, so where are all the parents? They said, you solved all the challenges. And the reason we could do that in such a short period of time is because we had the lead of mobile in the homes telling us, this is what you got to, this is really what you need to focus on, right? But we also delivered a really important message to parents who were used to waiting and not getting calls back that the system was responsive. 
When you called, we came, and you don't have to do anything more than that, right? You didn't have to scream and yell. You didn't have to go to the governor's office. You did certainly didn't have to. Um, you didn't have to hire an attorney, right? Um, and we we really had a goal of of having the attorneys not have to, you know, parents had not have to pay attorneys to get access to care. So those are the things that had to happen. But mobile led the way on that. Yeah. Okay. So um, different states and different communities use family partners and, and I would say family peer support in different ways. Um, for example, in Massachusetts, uh, caregiver peer support is a billable Medicaid service. So uh, the structure is that a, um, a mobile team, mobile crisis intervention team, is a family partner and a clinician. They can partner that way, and then those services are billable. In New Jersey, the family-run organization in each county um, actually has a, a relationship with the mobile response provider in the county, and they it's a warm handoff between those two organizations. The family partner would not necessarily go on the uh, assessment component, but there would be a call right away. It would be offered to the family. Um, it looks different in different jurisdictions based on whether it's a billable service or not, but it's very much used by mobile response and stabilization as um, the family component of, of the, um, the intervention and over the, the eight-week crisis stabilization and what comes next and to help parents and caregivers walk through the process um, and, and connect them with the supports that they need, particularly if it's going to be a longer intervention for the child. Hi. Uh, Robert Worth. I'm Colorado. Um, Liz, I know we've met a couple times. Yes, we came yeah. to New Jersey a couple times. The, the, uh, look at the system. We're still trying to figure it out. Um, I think part of our struggle is uh, we have parallel systems, right? Child welfare, community mental health, even even parts of Medicaid, um, and then the office of behavioral health, which is all other population uninsured populations don't intersect. So I think that's where we're failing. Uh, so we've been looking at the ASL model. Um, my question is: You mentioned the warm handoff to the mobile team, but what about mobile to ongoing services? Sure. Um, so. The, the model in New Jersey is all warm handoffs, right? So all warm handoffs. So let's say you have a, uh, a child who needs a higher intensity after mobile response because there is about, it's uh, probably about 40% of children who touch on mobile get a higher intensity service at some point. Um, when that happens, there's actually a connect, there's discussion that happens, but there's also the electronic record. So in the electronic record, all of the history of the services, the sports, the family's vision of what they're looking for, why they called in the first place, and what their perception of what needs to happen is all documented in the record. The care manager, uh, or who's ever picking up, and the uh, mobile response worker actually connect over the phone and they, act, they can act and do often come together in a, in a meeting together with the youth, the family, and the um, supports in place as a first child family team, if you will. That's kind of how it works. So it, I think it helps, and I used to have this slide in another deck, um, I think it helps to look at mobile response and stabilization services as a bridge, mm -hmm. both to the system and from the system. So uh, they connect families to all of those, the child serving systems that may as yet be un right. you know, disconnected at higher levels. But they have the capacity to, to create those bridges. That's right. Yeah, it just, let, let's just give you one more quick example. So the majority of youth don't go into higher intensity, but they do go into community community supports and services. So, and those community supports might be that they're re-engaging at school. Mobile will walk them through all of those components to make sure that they're all in place, all ready to go before they actually step out. Um, they can't step out until that plan is fully implemented. I'm Carrie Sutton Hodges from Oklahoma, and I just wanted to say thank you to all of you ladies who have um, lended your time and support uh, for Oklahoma. Um, you hosted uh, Shamika and our yeah. child welfare worker. We love to come Shamika. To yeah, she's awesome. <laughs> we do. We have um, to to yeah. see your model and to learn your model and come back and implement this in Oklahoma, it's just been a game changer for us. Um, when they first started down this path, um, was we were in a time of, of difficult budgets, and um, I was trying to balance the budget at the beginning of the year, and I went ahead and took a million out of what I anticipated residential uh, mm -hmm. for children would be, hoping that, you know, Shamika, you can do this. <laughs> and uh, I, I didn't mention it to her, I just, I just did it. Good strategy. 
by the end of that first year, we had actually seen a decrease of $3 million yeah. in the residential treatment yeah. line. Yeah. That's what and what was interesting is it those were children that didn't need to be in residential right. treatment. Right. Yeah. They needed supports and services to wrap around the family so that they could stay in the community. The second year, we layered into that where authorization for inpatient had to come through the outreach community service organizations. And so then the second year, then we had an additional six and a half million dollar savings on residential That's treatment. So, so those are dollars that we can invest back into our community services and and our mobile crisis and diversion. And it's just been beautiful. And it's families are, are much more much happier. And I knew it was working during that first year when I received a phone call from an inpatient location to say I don't know what you're doing, but it needs to stop because <laughs> I have all of these beds here. It's really affecting my census. Yeah. And uh -huh. I thought, sweet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I, I can tell, I'm so glad all of you were able to sit through this because I guarantee you most of your children's directors will be coming from the training institutes <laughs> and wanting to set up time with you to talk about just this. And now you'll have the slides and you kind of know what they're wanting to talk about. So uh, let's thank our panel um, and thank them for coming right after their huge meeting. Thank you. And David, David is right. We have it all queued up for you. Right. So we are really available. We've got people assigned to your states. We know you very well and we would be happy to help in any way we can as you want to think this through for implementation. So thank you for having us. Thank you. Thank you. And